Welcome everybody, glad you're here. I'm Karen Gimnig and I'm the Associate Director of the Co-Housing Association who sponsors these web chats. Karen Hoskin is with us um, on her cell phone listening in. Welcome to Katie McCammon. She's gonna take us through um, sort of stages of getting co-housing off the ground and she's gonna give us the, the summary version because as she says, she could do a week of this <laughs> and, and you should pay her to get a week of this because she's very good at that. Um, she is the principal of co-housing solutions, one of the people who coined the term co-housing in the United States, um, one of the beginners of bringing co-housing to yeah, us. I can go. Years and years well, and of- And then you're gonna come over here. Um, so welcome, Katie, I'll hand it off to you. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks very much. So I do wanna uh, I'll give you uh, both a little bit about me and, and uh, more importantly, a pitch for the Co-Housing Association. Um, I, you know, was one of the founding board members for the association. I think it is a uh, really, really important to the ongoing movement and growth of co-housing, um, both in connecting people to communities around the country and sharing the best experience, the, you know, the best practices amongst us. Um, and so I hope that all of you, especially as we come into year end, are, will be supporting the association because I don't, I think not everybody realizes that the only financial support for the association is you and me making our donations. There's no outside support. So I just want to remind everybody that we all need to support the co-housing association. Um, I, you know, I've been doing co-housing development for the last 30 years plus. I've worked uh, as an architect I've worked as a project manager in the trenches at every level. I've been the developer partnering with co-housing communities. And today I work as a, a, co a development consultant uh, working with communities all across North America. And so, and, and I've been a buyer and a homeowner in co-housing for most of the last 30 years too. So I bring a lot of different perspectives. And, um, and I think the beauty of that is that it really helps me understand and hopefully share with my clients how different things interact and how the whole comes together. Because I, I do I've pretty much done every aspect of getting projects built in numerous projects. So, um, so, so that's what we're gonna do is kind of do a high level view through the steps of getting a project built or the 10,000 steps to getting to home. Because it is, a million different details that need to come together from a wide range of different disciplines in order to actually build buildings um, that you want to live in. So this is a sort of overview of the development process and I'm going to go through each one and then we can circle back to this. So I know it's a little hard to read and, and I find almost all timelines are confusing except for the person who's actually worked them out and put them up. So, but I think the sort of the, the overview is that it typically takes two and a half to four years to get a project built. And that is from the time you have land under contract. Before you have land under contract, you have no timeline. Right, there's, you know, cause that's really the question is when do you get to land under contract and are moving forward? So for most co-housing communities, there is this period early on where you're organizing your group to have what it takes to move forward on an actual project. And that when people say a project ten, takes 10 years, that's usually where they spent a lot of time before they got to a land under contract. So, and I'll circle back and talk to that. Then, you know, you, you have the acquiring the land and working through the uh, land development or entitlement phase and the design phases. So from the most schematic design to more and more detail. And I'm gonna circle back and talk about each one of these phases. So uh, don't get too concerned about not being able to, to under, see this right now. And then finally get to construction. And I would say generally construction of a project, co-housing project size, if you're building it all at once, ranges from 14 to 18 months for construction. But let's back up here and talk about the first phase. 
launching a project, getting a group off the ground. So the question I usually ask my clients when they come to me is, if the perfect site showed up next week, are you ready? Are you ready to put up money? Because I think one of the biggest hurdles for communities to get over, or for individuals to get over, because at that stage you're not a community, is to facing the harsh reality that unless you're ready to invest money to move the project forward, it is unlikely anybody else will do that for you. So there are very, very few co-housing communities that have been blessed to have a developer start them and you could join. So um, many of you probably heard of Jim Leach and Wonderland Hill Development Company in Colorado. Um, he's now retired, so he's no longer acting as a developer, but he was the unique developer who was willing to get con land under contract and move it forward and people could join much easier. But the large, and I did a few of those here in California, but the large majority of co-housing communities, the money that gets it off the ground is the individual buyers. And so it tends to take a while for communities meeting and, and actually eventually getting so impatient that they realize that they're either gonna fall apart or just continue as a potluck club uh, without actually getting something built before people are really to take that you know, invest their own funds to move a project forward. So, so when I think there's, you know, then, then the other question I would ask early, you know, when you're looking at, should we move this project forward is, are people familiar with co-housing in your area? Is there a market there? If you had a project and you said, you know, there's an opportunity to join a co-housing group, do you have people in your area that would be ready? And that varies quite radically across the country. So, you know, if you take the West Coast and particularly if in and around the West Coast cities, there are quite a few co-housing communities and a lot of people have heard about it. So there you might be in, you know, in a, in a situation where if you have a co-housing opportunity, you can go out to the market and you're not introducing the concept to people for the very first time. But in a lot of parts of the country, most people have never heard of co-housing. And so if you're gonna, so instead of just going out to find land, I think that in many situations, what you really need to do is build your market. And so often at this stage, what I'm recommending to communities is that you typically would have a small core group that is doing the hard work of moving the project forward um, and what you're really trying to do is to get the word out about what co-housing is. Why would you want to live in a co-housing community and build your database, even if those people don't become members right now? Because frankly, it's a really small portion of the population who can deal with the levels of uncertainty and commit significant amounts of time and money to launch a project when you don't know where it is, you don't know what it will cost, you don't know what the timeline is. So at this stage, you're really doing, you know, from the marketing perspective, is you're trying to build as large a database as possible and get as many people in your region thinking about co-housing and thinking about why they might want to live in co-housing, even if they are not active members of your community and are still unwilling to put money up there you at least you're building that market. The other things these early stage communities do is to educate yourself on, on you know, visiting other co-housing communities and beginning to define your site criteria, as well as practicing and beginning, you know, getting your systems in place in terms of how you organize the group, how you make decisions, how you facilitate meetings. So there is a lot of work you can do before you have land to prepare yourself for the phases ahead. As you sort of start to move forward, you, you know, you've started to build a database, you've got more people interested, you've got your systems in place, you know how to have well-run meetings, then you really start to hone in on what is your site criteria? What density are you looking for? What part of town 
are you thinking that you might want to live in? Where are the opportunities? What is the zoning? How is your town or city? What, you know, where are, the, where, where are the places that would have the kind of zoning that would allow you to do co-housing? And then, and as you start to do that research is beginning to understand the current land market. Is it a hot market? How much money are you gonna to need to have ready if, to uh, put a deposit on land? And that really varies depending on how hot the market. So the same place, the same location could be very different property market, you know, from five years apart. But I think this is where you're starting to get a sense of how do we focus our site search? What do we need to be ready to do? And where are the opportunities in our market? And there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, almost, almost every municipality and county across the country now has their zoning code and their other planning documents available on, the web, on their websites. So beginning to familiarize yourselves with, with in the zoning across the, the area that you're looking at to understand you know, how zoning works in your area. I think one of the big things is density. Uh, people don't, you know, I mean, I think as a public, people aren't familiar with density and what does it mean when you say six units to the acre versus 20 units to the acre? You know, for an architect or developer, as soon as you say, you know, the, you know what the density of a zoning allows, I have an image in my mind what kind of building that's likely to be. But most people have never thought of that. And so, you know, begin to understand, you know, how much land are you going to need for the kind of density you're looking for? And does that align with where you want to be um, in, with the, in your area? So just as an example, you could build 27 units on half an acre in an urban situation. That would be like PDX Commons. Or you could build 27 units on two acres. That would be like Frog Song in Katati. Or you could build 27 units on 10 acres, and that would be a much more, with gardens and much more empty area, right? Sort of op open space area. But where, the, where you're likely to get that much space is likely to be on the edge of town, further out in a more car dependent situation. So there's, there's not any right or wrongs. It's just trying to figure out with your group that is doing the work on this, where do you want to focus? What is the density you're looking at? And Karen, you can tab there. I'd be glad to do a whole webinar on density next year, because I think that's one of the things that are really helping people understand what densities mean. And you know, what does that look like? So, so those are all things that add into your site criteria. Um, the other thing, this sort of how hot is the market? So within any given region, there is a very small number of property brokers, land brokers. This is not your, you know, house selling realtors, but commercial brokers who understand and whose primary business is, is, is commercial properties and developable land. Those guys, and they are mostly guys, I'm afraid, but those guys are the ones who really understand the developed market in terms of where land is available, how hot is the market, and what do you need to be able to compete. They also are very impatient because their income is directly related to how many deals they close. And so it's not, you really want to make sure you're ready before you go out looking for a land broker because first, it's likely to take a bit of effort to convince them that you're real and that you're actually able to close on land. And if you futz around and ask too many questions and can't respond quickly, they're gonna quickly write you off as you know, a place they could waste a lot of time but are unlikely to actually get a sale out of. But when you can get to one, one of the things they can really help you understand is how hot is the market and what's the expectations in the current market in your region 
in terms of how much money you need to be ready to put down, how long can you hold property without getting under contract, without actually buying it, and who are you competing with. And I think at that stage, you really want to get real about what you can compete with. So just as an example, <clears throat> in this, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area has been a very hot market for the last five plus years. I know that most co-housing groups can't compete with the big developers for land there. For you in, in New York City, this is your, gonna be your challenge, is that those are markets that are dominated by large developers with significant cash that can move quickly. It's almost impossible for a co-housing group to compete in those markets. So you are, in those situations, you're really looking for the unique situation, right? And so understanding what the market is and what you can really do. So there's sort of what you hope for, and then there's, you know, where you, knowing your own limitations as a community. What I've seen is co-housing groups can usually do more than they think they can, but there definitely is a limit in terms of uh, how fast they can move and how much money they can raise quickly. So in most cases, uh, for a co-housing group, what you're really looking for is someone who will give you time so you're not negotiating so much on price, but on time before you have to have to buy the land. So we could do a whole webinar just on site search and the process of buying land. So we're gonna leave it at that. But some of the things that you need, you know, you start looking at as you begin to define a site search strategy and move forward to looking to actual properties. So then, miracle of miracle, you find land and you get it under contract. So first and foremost, the first rule, never forget this, spend very little money on any parcel before you have a signed written agreement. I don't care how nice that seller is. So you're not going out to do any feasibility studies. You're not getting a geotechnical report. You're not getting a septic or perk report. You know, you're not doing any design until you get the land under contract. Because when you're talking to landowners, you can often, you might find that you are, you think you're talking about the same thing, but until you have a signed deal, you don't really know. So, but then you actually get a signed contract for the purchase of land. That kicks you into a whole nother world. All of a sudden time is money and, it's, and money is due. And it's how quickly can we move forward, raise money and grow our group in order to move on this project. So the first thing is the feasibility stage. The feasibility stage is not about coming up with the perfect design for your community. It's identifying what are the red flags that could come between us and a successful project, and what is the research we can do in a quick and dirty way to get comfortable that we have a feasible project. So we may not know, you know whether we're gonna lay out the buildings this way or that way, but we know that we can get enough buildings on the site for a viable project. So you're looking at understanding the zoning, you know, and what is the process to get a project approved. So I, it is occasionally possible to increase the density and the number of units on a parcel, but in many situations that would be a very big risk. And so there are many situations that I would suggest that <clears throat> you need, you would go forward only if you could live with the current zoning, not getting an increase in density. But there are some situations where, in fact, you know, the city's actually plans to increase the density. They're already in the plan and it's not such a big risk. So again, understanding what the zoning will allow as it sits, what is the process to move that forward and how long will that take and how much do you need to submit to the city or county at each stage for those approvals. Cost is a big one. So this is where we're running our first budgets. We're running budgets on a educated guesses. That's, that's all your first budgets are. 
but that's a big eye opener in terms of the number of units. Um, so one of the things I've seen happen a lot is communities get land and they um, under contract and the zoning might allow 28 units and they say, oh, well, we don't want to do that big a community. We think we'll just do 16. And my first question is, have you run a budget? And a budget will immediately take you to 28 units in most cases. So that you know, I think in terms of having any idea about the design and still you start running a development budget and get some sense of cost, you're gonna have an unrealistic view about what your cost will be and how many homes you need. So in most situations, we're building to the full density capacity of a site. So then the market, you know, and every single site is different in terms of what are feasibility issues. I remember when we, uh, the Pleasant Hill group in Pleasant Hill, California first got their land under contract. We knew there was a lot of interest in co-housing on the Oakland Berkeley side of the hills, but we didn't know if there were people that would move over the hills to Pleasant Hill. So we talked to the planning department and that felt like that was a viable option. That felt like they were actually really supportive of it. But what we found in the first 60 days is we worked with a very small core group in order to test the market and literally to see how many people could we get to put $2,000 down to get comfortable that there was a market willing to move to that location. In other situations, it might be the environmental concerns. You know, is what's the previous uses? Typically, um, Anytime you buy land, you're getting what is called a phase one environmental report. It's a historic report of the previous uses on this property and whether there is any reason to suspect that there is some previous use of the property or nearby that could lead you to have uh, environmental issues in the ground. Because <clears throat> you don't, you know, once you buy the land, you inherit those problems. So first you need the phase one for any financing, but you also don't want to move forward without land because you inherit the problems once you buy it. So you would want to make sure you had a phase one early. Neighbors, you know, again, particularly if you are trying to change the zoning or increase density, the neighbor's reaction is going to be really important. Now, let me just, Put that in some context. You know, I've been around quite a while. I've done a lot of development. I get kind of skeptical about this. So my, my view is you will always have neighborhood opposition. It is highly likely to be way uglier than you ever imagined because until you've actually tried to build things, you cannot believe how ugly people get. Um, but it's a question that I'm looking at. So I never, I never assume that's not going to be some opposition. I'm looking for, is it, is it something we can get through? What is the, you know, what are the things we're asking for within the zoning? And do we have a good probability that we'll be able to get those approvals? So, or it could be something else altogether. So really what you're looking for in this feasibility stage is, what could stop us from getting our project built in a way that we can afford and focusing your time and money on that right off the get-go. And so who do you need for that? Well, I think that there's the three first consultants you really want on board at this phase. So you want somebody who understand, has a history with development, has done development for, with you that is working with you on a development budget. So that's often my role with communities, or if you're partnering with a developer that has you know, experience building projects, they could be the one doing that. But I think someone who's got development experience who can really, you know, because there's always costs that people wouldn't even imagine until they've gotten into it. An attorney, because, you know, at this point you've got a land, you know, contract, so you want an attorney working with you on that. And any, you know, so mostly initially it's about the purchase agreement, but also how you organize yourselves, what's your development entity, you know, so having, you know, an attorney that you're, you can get to that you've already got on board. 
And then your architect, because the architect can be very useful in terms of uh, talking to the planning report, uh, department, helping you understand the zoning and what's possible there. So it's um, a fast and furious phase so that then you can then start on the schematic design. So the first phase of design is really about defining your criteria. And what you're trying to do is, is to look at how you're gonna lay out the massing or the buildings on a site. You know, so in an urban site, you know, you know, we're going up four stories and what are our setbacks and what, what can we really build on that? Or a more suburban site, you know, are there creeks we need to set back? Um, you know, how do we get, how do we actually want to lay our buildings on the property? And then with the next, you know, within that is uh, your home design and, but probably more importantly is your unit mix. How many two bedrooms, how many three bedrooms, how many one bedrooms? Um, and the planning department actually, you know, typically when you submit this first level of design to your planning department, they will want floor plans, but it's not about the floor plans. They don't really care about the floor plans. Um, and in fact, I got to the point where I would just make the floor plans really small because the last thing I needed was their comments on floor plans. It's really about how the buildings sit on the property and a lot of civil engineering. And particularly today, one of the big issues is how do you deal with stormwater? So drainage, stormwater, utilities, are there utilities in the street? Do you need to bring utilities in? Are they sized at a level that will meet your needs? Are there wetlands that you need to set back from? And that's what, your, that's what the planning department needs. What you as a community needs is, you know, what is my house gonna cost? So for that reason, you are getting into home design and the common house design. So at this end of schematic design, you have, a set of floor plans and a site plan and what the buildings might look like. You don't know whether you're, you know, the heating and cooling system, you don't know what's on the countertops, you don't know what the, you know, the roofing is, but you've got the basic layout and floor plans for the whole project. And entitlements refers to a term which is an approval through the planning department as opposed to uh, then approval at the building department phase. So the planning department phase tends to be a more political process. And again, that will really depend on your zoning, uh, how risky that is and whether it is open to a public hearing and at the discretion of a planning commission or whether you are given a right to build a certain number of units so long that you meet different codes. So going back to feasibility, one of the key things you're really un trying to understand is what is, are the discretionary approvals and who makes those? So again, are you going to the planning commission? Is it something you can work out on the staff level? Once you're at a public hearing, you're open to the neighborhood um, input and it can really, it's a much more political process. So I think that the interesting thing from a co-housing point of view is really all the major design decisions about how you lay out on the site are decided in the first six months after you have land. It also is what really sets up your budget. And from a development perspective, the whole question is how fast can we get through schematic design and get this submitted to the planning department? And so there's a real push to get this through. And I think for many communities, it feels a pretty chaotic phase. That's the phase where you're doing, you know, full weekend workshops every month to get a design that you're ready to submit. Um, and if you take longer, it just means that you're adding cost and risk to your project. Because in development, time equals risk, time adds money. So that's why it's such a push to get through this phase. Uh, because um, it's your money on the line. So then you get that design done. And I would say, I think it's really important to be 
very careful about how you talk about your design in the neighborhood before you know what you want. But you will, once you've got that schematic design done, one of the things, you know, you're, you're doing two different things. You're marketing for other, other neighbors, for people who want to buy into the community. So you're looking for your future neighbors. But you are also running a PR campaign with the neighborhood. And how much effort you put into that is directly related to the level of discretionary approvals at the planning department. So in some cases, you know, you have the zoning, they really can't stop you. So it's really about being a good neighbor. And in other situations, they can totally shut you down. And so it is everything is about the neighborhood approval, getting neighborhood buy-in. So I think I often tell communities that this is an excellent opportunity for you to practice your active listening skills. Because as we're learning from the new research in politics, is you don't change people's minds. So this is not about negotiating design details. It's about building relationships. And so the more that the neighbors see you as a community, as someone thing they want in their neighborhood as being good neighbors, the easier this will make you, it all happen for you. So I had a really a sort of eye-opening experience with a uh, Wolf Creek Lodge uh, here in Grass Valley, where the neighborhood just went through the roof. Um, and if there's just, they were just a different paradigm, um, you know, so they came to visit Nevada City Co-Housing and that even got them more scared. These were not, co the neighbors were not co-housers, that was clear right? They did not want to live in co-housing at all. Um, but by, you know, so I, I sent the group out and they literally, I made them go door to door. We had open sites. We talked to the neighborhood association and we just did a whole series of ongoing meetings. And by the time we got to city council for our big approval, we had a last meeting with the neighborhood association. And one of the neighbors said, well, I don't know why you would ever want to live in a place like this, but you're sure nice people. <laughs> and so that was, you know, the light bulb went off in my mind of that. It's like, this is about building relationships. It's not about convincing them that co-housing is a great thing because some of them really have absolutely no interest. It's, you know, it's pretty rare for neighbors to think. But I think the other thing about neighborhood re outreach is to really think about how you talk about it to the neighborhood. Because if you're explaining co-housing about why you are going to be having such a great time living in co-housing, from the outside, it can feel like you're just having a great party and I'm not invited. So this is all about not why you would want to buy in co-housing, but why co-housing is a good neighbor and why you're going to want us in your neighborhood. So homeownership, active participation in the larger neighborhood, you know, looking for the issues and how you're going to support and be a good neighbor is really the key here. And that process varies radically depending on, you know, the approval process of your jurisdiction. So again, it all goes back to the zoning. Very, very different timelines and what's involved in that in different parcels. So, but if it requires a zoning, then, you know, basically once you get that entitlement, once you get that planning approval, you've significantly reduced the risk in your project uh, because you now know that you have approval for a certain number of units with a certain massing, with a specific number of parking spaces and setbacks and conditions of approval from the planning department of what's gonna be required when you build. So you know a, a lot more about what you, you know, what's gonna be allowed and what's gonna be required. So at that phase, you dive into the next phase of design, which is design development and construction documents. And those are two different specific phases of design that can run right into the other. At this point, you're really handing over to the architects. So, you know, the architects, I would recommend that the architects and your consultants are recommending to you how to hold your budget 
um, which means, you know, and making a recommendation on the finishes, the siding, the aesthetic, the roofing, and particularly what that might, you know, how to get the highest value out of that and still try to hold your budget. If a community drives this process, the likelihood that you will end up with a project you can't afford is very, very high. So I think at this phase, you want to be clear about the construction budget you're trying to meet, and you want to let the consultants drive it. So you're actually, you're not doing workshops in the same way you were in the earlier phase. You're, uh, the architect may be reporting back and they're working out the building code and coordinating between all the engineers to put together a set of drawings that the contractor can bid and that you can submit for permits. At the same time, it's during this phase that you're lining up construction financing. So, and it takes um, ever longer, it seems, to line up construction financing. So while the architects and engineers are working on their drawings, you're starting to talk to banks about construction financing and terms, and you know, so that those things can align at the time that you're ready to submit for building permits. So you submit for building permits, the contractor goes out to bid, and you know, that's a couple, you know, that's really, that's usually two to three months with just those two things. So you wrestle your construction contract into something that you can actually afford. There's often a lot of back and forth and what do we need to change to get the budget down to get to the start of construction. So construction is a very exciting time and it's the time the group needs to stay off the site. So my rule, if I was managing your project, is the only time the residents, the community co-housing members are allowed on the construction site is a once a, once a month site visit. That's what you see here. Otherwise, you need to stay out of the way and let the contractors do their job. Now, does that mean you don't inspect? Of course you inspect. So that's, again, you want, those are your professionals. So your architect, your engineers, and your project manager, not the contractor's project manager, but what's called the owner's rep, owner's representative. One person with experience is representing you with the contractor. And now they'll bring, there may be questions or changes that come out of that process that they'll bring back to the group. But, there's very few things during construction that go back to the whole group. It is much more likely that you'll have a small construction interface team, we call it the CIT, that is working with the owner's rep on responding to questions and changes that come up during construction. The more the larger community is involved, the more likely you are to blow your budget and your timeline. And I can tell you, even without your involvement, it's hard to keep those two things in line. So at this point, have good professionals that you trust and let them do their job. And then finally, you get to move in. <laughs> and, you know, it's, you know, I think it's really exciting to see a project come together. And I think one of the really, you know, exciting things about being part of a developing community is to, to actually be, be part of something where you start with this, you know, very uh, sort of vague vision of what you want to create and then work through those design phases to the point where you are actually watching it come out of the ground and then get to move into it. It's a pretty powerful process to be part of. Um, it also can be exhausting. I think, uh, uh, groups typically go through, you, you know, very great excitement about moving in and then looking around at all the projects they've got in front of them. And there's often a sort of a fallback <laughs> uh, period about a couple of months after move-in. So key points that I want to leave you with before we open for questions. First of all, keep in mind, you are not inventing real estate development. There are people out there building 25 unit townhouses projects all day, every day. It's been done before. All you're trying to do is really about the location of the buildings and the added common facilities. 
So you don't need to reinvent real estate development. And real estate development is, is more expensive and more risky than most people realize. So get good expertise early, people with real experience who've been through this a lot, and then listen to them. When they tell you that, you, you know, that if, if you want a more affordable project, you really need to do this, if you really want to hold that budget, I would listen to them. I think uh, many of a group kind of can runs away with this vision only to have to cut back on their design to get it back into their budget. So what I think you can do as a co-housing community to be most helpful to your professional team is to focus and be clear about your, co your core goals, your core values, and don't try to do it all. Every co-housing community wants to be the most affordable, most energy efficient, most sustainable community ever developed out there. But there's limits of what you can do to balance those things. So rather than trying to build, calm everything on to this one project in the initial phase, get down to what it is that you can really get built and stay focused on that. There are a lot of things that can happen after you move in. But if you don't get the project built, those things will never move in. And one of the, those, you know, the big areas with that is affordable housing. So I could tell you stories for the rest of the night about how, you know, renters and single parents and families have all come into my community in Nevada City co-housing in all sorts of creative ways after we got the project built. It wasn't, if we had stalled out because we were trying to find subsidies that don't exist, didn't get the project built, none of those things could happen. So being clear about what it is, what's the core project we need to get built in order to allow everything else to happen over the next 20 years. Then getting real about the money. Um, you are dealing with the same cost of new development that every developer in the country is dealing with your project is not gonna be magically way more affordable than what other new construction. You might reallocate what you think are the priorities to spend money on, and you might you know, pull the parking to the side so the design might be different, but it's gonna be in the same realm as other new construction in your area. And nobody's gonna put up the money for you. And so what really drives these projects is buyers that are willing to put up the money for that early design before you know even what the floor plan is. But that's what gets developers willing to partner with co-housing groups, gets banks willing to lend, is when your money skin in the game and really says, we're real buyers, we know there's risk, we're putting our own money up. Then I think, again, sort of this really defining criteria and thinking about priorities so that your maximum community participation in terms of the real real estate development happens really in that first year after you have land under contract. Then you turn, if you can give your professionals clear criteria, it is much more likely that they can meet them. But they're then really driving the project and you are giving them feedback responding to that. But I think after that first year, the group really then can go back and focus more on what is the culture we're creating? How do we want to actually live in the community as well as finding the rest of your buyers? Because really one of the key roles the co-housing group plays is marketing and filling out the project and finding your other neighbors. So let the professionals do their work and the community can focus on building the relationships that really are the heart of any community. So that is my very quick overview of the co-housing development process. And I think now would be a great time to open for questions. Okay, we have a few in the chat and with our numbers and our short time, I'm gonna encourage other questions also, if you'll add them to the chat, I'll pull them from there. Um, so someone wanted to confirm that you'd want to put your land under contract before doing feasibility? Yep, because you don't want to spend any money. Feasibility costs money. Ha. 
Um, and then and let me just maybe qualify that. You know, you could do some, you know, I'd go talk to the planning department. So I'd do whatever I could do that was, in essence, free. But I would not be hiring any soils engineers. I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't, I would not invest in, in any, you know, hiring consultants in any significant way until we knew we could get it under contract. Um, and there's a request for the recording and slideshow to be shared, and I'm guessing you would be willing to send me your slides? Sure. Okay, I'll get that from Riley, so those will go out, and I'll, I have the recording that should go up within the next week. Um, and someone, I think, is answering their own question, but I'll let you chime in on this too. Isn't our project cheaper because no one is laughing all the way to the bank? Ha ha. No one is getting rich off this. I thought it would be cheaper than regular commercial development. Sounds like I was wrong. Yes, I only wish that was true. But we have other things that uh, add to co-housing cost. And part of it is the inefficiency of how groups work their way through the development process. But a lot of it is the additional common facilities. We're building, you know, 3,000 square feet of common facilities that nobody else is including in their projects. We, we tend to like a little more energy efficiency we want, you know. So, yeah, so I, it does not end up cheaper. Other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Just writing one right now. So please give me one minute. Sure, that's great. So this, another one did come in. So um, somebody was asking how to get to the recording and the slides. They'll be on the website, cohousing.org. Um, and you can go cohousing.org slash web chats, or you can go to the footer and find the web chats link. Um, or you can search for web chats, but those will be up within about the next week. You mentioned getting financed from developers. Do you have experience with this? What does this look like? Well, yes. Um, so really, I mean, it's, it's typically it's the banks that you're getting the construction financing from. Um, I do think, I, I believe that there are many situations where it was very much in uh, co-housing groups uh, best, you know, it serves them to partner with the developer. So maybe we could just take a few minutes to talk. Why would you partner with the developer? Don't they just take all the money? Um, well, no, I think what developers bring is a number of different things. So one is that they, they know civil engineers, they know the geotech, they know the planning department. So um, it's very, you know, working with the developer, they can help direct you to the other consultants and help you understand uh, where do you put your money in time first? So uh, it can be very valuable to have a, a development partner or at least a, a professional consultant that has an understanding of that and has built housing and specifically multifamily housing, not individual homes before. But the other key reason to partner with the developer is to get construction financing. Uh, banks are, are, are very hesitant to loan to a group of buyers and it will require you to put more money than you ever imagined and more guarantees than you ever imagined. But there's just, it's actually really difficult to find a bank that would even be willing to talk to you about building a $10 million project because you don't have a track record, um, you don't have deep pockets to back a loan, you don't have, you know, the collateral and the guarantees. So I think that uh, that's once people have a better understanding of what it takes to get construction financing, they are much more interested in partnering with the developer. It also varies. So I think that a more rural project um, is easier to do without a developer than a more urban project. Uh, the more urban projects, they're, they're more complex. The construction is much more complex. They tend to be bigger money. So, you know, you know, different communities go different ways. And, and that's one of the things, yeah, that's what, one of the things I do a lot is help communities figure out who do they need on their professional team, what are their options, and what, you know, and help go find a developer to partner with them or look at other approaches, um, depending what's appropriate for any time and place in a specific community. Okay, um, next question is, I'd like to know about the very early stages. We've had four meetings, each attracts approximately 15 people. 
and at each new meeting approximately three return. So it's slowly building. How do I move forward? What topics shape should we talk about at the meetings? When do we conduct values workshops, vision workshops? Well, I, I tend to think the early stages um, is, is it's, I mean, because is really more about educating yourselves and getting, you know, why would I, I, I always go back to is you build your market by why would I want to live in co-housing? Right. It's a it's like why, you know, if it's gonna cost, and I think you need to assume that, you know, those same dollars could buy you another house, right? It's not like it, it isn't less expensive. So why would I choose this over that and building your market within that? Um, I would focus then on uh, you know, in addition to that, group process skills. I tend to um Personally, my bias is sort of not to spend a lot of time about our values because it is very typical that when you actually get land under contract, there's a bit of a sort out of who's real and who's moving forward. So you'll have people who have been coming to potlucks for years that are not ready to put up money to move, be part of the group moving forward. And you'll have people who came and went and didn't, never really committed suddenly show up because now it's real. So I think that you don't really know who your core group is until you have property. And there are some exceptions. I mean, there are some core groups that are strong enough or their regions are such where they really moved forward on contract. But it's, it's not unusual to sort of lose half the people you think are interested and gain another half very quickly around that time when you get land under contract. And so, you know, how much effort do you want to put into very specific things about how the project goes forward. On the other hand, site criteria, you know, are we looking in that whole question of density of, you know, are we looking for, you know, five acres where we can have orchards and gardens or we do we want to be in a walkable neighborhood so we're going to live in a much uh, lower density, you know, much higher density and with an elevator building. And then um, going and visiting new communities, uh, not just co-housing, but new condo developments, new townhouse developments. So you can kind of get a sense of the market, what else is being built. I think a lot of times, you know, I work with a lot of people who are looking at um, being part of a very urban co-housing community, but they've never lived in that urban environment. So when you look at, you know, home sizes and how does that feel, I think it can be really helpful to sort of have a sense of what else is out there. What do condos go for? How do they lay them out? What are the dimensions? So all of that stuff is really good education where you're building your, your foundational background. So when you're looking at a specific situation, you can you have more about understanding what that means. So we have maybe one minute for one more quick question. And I apologize to those we are not getting to. I, I, most of them are uh, getting more and more into the detail. So I apologize that we're not getting to everybody. But I will let you do this one because I'm pretty sure you can do it quickly, which is what about rehabbing a commercial building, a loft or something like that? Factory, is, it that, is that cheaper? Uh, no, I mean, it can get you really a great space. You know, the first community I, I was part of here in the United States is Doyle Street Co-Housing in Emeryville and we converted an, an existing warehouse and added a second story to it. It wasn't cheaper. In some ways it was actually more complicated because you had new materials intersecting with old materials and lots of building code challenges, but it got us really unique spaces because it was this old warehouse with 13 foot high ceilings and brick walls. So typically it's not cheaper. The only way that it's cheaper would be the other kind of what we call retrofit co-housing, which is not changing a commercial building, but would be um, moving into an existing neighborhood and buying up homes and opening up the backyards. So the way to get in cheaper is using existing housing stock and not radically rehabbing it. So that, that, then you're, like I say, you're using it, it's not going to be brand new, it's not going to be the latest energy efficiency, but it can be much more affordable, uh, particularly if it's not the nicest neighborhood in town, right? And so there you have the N Street co-housing example, where it was at 1960 bungalows, they're pretty cheap buildings, but there was a lot of turnover. 
so people could buy in at very affordable levels, fix them up as they can afford to, um, but that's a totally different cost structure. So if you're trying, it's actually something I really, I really encourage people uh, because new construction is very, it's, it's surprisingly expensive these days and it's gotten only worse the last three years. So if you're really looking at a more affordable model, I would look at, like I say, buying in the same neighborhood, buying in an existing condominium. An older condominium is gonna be so much more affordable than something newly built. It may not be perfect, it won't be, you know, may not be a great co-housing design, but that's the way you get into a more affordable situation. Thank you, Katie. Also some, go ahead and read the chat, Katie, because there's many people saying nice things about you and your, your great presentation, and I appreciate that. I wanna take just a few minutes for our um, association announcements. Um, we do have the new website. Um, if you haven't been on it since May, go back. It's a whole new ball game. Um, if you're part of a community that's either not yet listed on the directory or hasn't put your new directory on the new website since May, um, take a look at doing that. If you need help, you can reach me at um, karencohous at gmail.com or through the website, contact us. Um, so do be looking at that. It is um, lots and lots of great information and, and even maybe some of the answers to questions you've been asking, you might find on there. So take a look at that. Um, you can find Katie at cohousingsolutions.com. That's right, yes? Mm -hmm. um, so always can reach her there. Um, you're asking the kinds of questions that she helps her clients with in great detail. So you can help her with that. Next web chat is Thursday, December 5th, and I get to sit on the other side of the table for that one and present about um, personal growth in co-housing and why we want to be celebrating that. So Karen will be with us to host that one and we'll have a good night for that. And the other thing I want to draw your attention to is the association, as Katie said, is funded by your donations. And we're in the midst of our Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, so Giving Tuesday, as you know, is sort of the, the answer to Black Friday and Cyber Monday that's all about spending your money on stuff. And we're going to ask you on Giving Tuesday to think about contributing to the mission that is co-housing and the ways that we make the world a better place for people who live in co-housing and everyone who knows them. Um, and how we really reach out into the broader world for many of the goals that we have around more functional democracies and things like that. So um, that is coming up. You can give to giving our Giving Tuesday campaign at any time. You don't have to wait until Tuesday. And we have an anonymous donor who's matching those gifts up to $10,000 this year. So it's a chance to have double the impact with your donation. And you can do that at cohousing.org. Just click the donate button. Or if you're on the Facebook group or Facebook page or Almost any place you might be getting information from us, you'll, you're reading about that intention. We're trying to get funded so we can continue to do all the great services that we've been doing, including more web chats, because we want to take Katie up on her offer of a density chat next year. <laughs> so if you can help us out with that, um, donations in any amount are very welcome and do make the difference of being able to keep doing what we're doing. So. Thank you, everybody. It's been great to see you all and join us for the next round on December 5th. We'll see you then. Thanks, Karen and Carm. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>